Hello, Trail Seeker, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Learn True Health podcast. This episode and the next two episodes after this one are going to be a series. I am excited and nervous to publish them. There is a threat that might eliminate my podcast, and that is free speech. So I bring you three doctors. These are medical doctors. One of them is also a PhD and cardiologist and research scientist. Today's doctor, Dr. Paul Thomas, is a pediatric uh, physician, general physician of over 30 years. And each of my guests, the next, this and the next two, the three episodes, are all doctors who've been practicing for a very long time, 30 plus years each, I believe. And they are being silenced for speaking the truth, for sharing science. And it's a science that has been so controversial because it goes against what is being taught in the mainstream. So I invite you to open your minds, take in all the information, become critical thinkers if you're not already, and use this information to empower you. We will not fearmonger. Uh, we will not coerce. It is all about sharing free information and allowing us to think for ourselves. Please share my podcast with those you care about. Share this episode with those who want to keep learning and growing and continue to educate themselves on the best choices possible for that they can make for themselves and their family as it pertains to their health. I interviewed Dr. Paul Thomas back in episode 224 and he shared his, the stories in his life um, as a child growing up in Africa to white missionary parents and the perspective it gave him uh, in order to become a doctor. And then the, his experiences in his early career watching children um, go through regular wellness checks as we know them today and experience uh, side effects from uh, vaccines and see how the CDC schedule was not optimal for every patient. And that led him to create a, his solution, which was to use one vaccine at a time and watch and see how the child reacts to it. He then wrote a book called uh, The uh, Vaccine-Friendly Plan. And his whole approach is he's not anti-vaccine. He's also not pro-vaccine. And this sort of upsets people on both sides of the spectrum. I hope that you, like me, try to stay in the middle and take in all the information and not vilify either side, but just take in all the information uh, in order to make informed decisions instead of uh, pressured by fear or coercion, make informed decisions. He shares some amazing information and he did it back in 224. So you can go back and listen to that episode as well. But today he shares some information that is so empowering, that is so mind blowing. I hope you go to the links of the studies he has published in journals that show the findings of his studies. And if you're like me, you will get excited because this information is empowering when we take it all in without emotion and we really look at it. And then we can decide how to navigate our health choices based on all of the research and this information. So I'm excited for you to listen to this episode and I really, really want you to share it with those that you think will, but it'll help them to also make informed choices in their life um, to help them. So thank you for being a listener of the Learn Child podcast. Thank you for sharing. If you ever find, you ever go to your favorite podcast directory like iTunes, uh, Spotify, iHeartRadio, wherever, wherever you listen to my show, if you ever go there and you find my show has been is just all of a sudden not there anymore, then I have been censored. Um, I post my show also on library. I believe it's called LBRY. Um, and I post it uh, everywhere I possibly can. 
Uh, but just so you know, if you don't find me there, you can also email me, support at learntruehealth.com. If you, uh, you ever all of a sudden can't find my podcast, if I've been censored and deleted and blocked, um, just know that I'll still be publishing in places where censorship um, doesn't exist or where there are still parts of the internet where freedom of speech uh, is still protected. So I will continue to publish in those areas. So you can, f- you can follow me on library, LBRY. And, um, and, uh, come to the Learn Trail Facebook group as long, as long as Facebook allows us to be there, we will be there. We've got a robust and beautiful Facebook community. Just search Learn Trail Health in Facebook. And, uh, we have a wonderful community there of people who are uh, answering questions and, and seeking advice and seeking, uh, solutions to grow, to learn, to achieve true health. Enjoy today's interview and please also listen to the next two interviews that I'll be publishing because I think that this is a is a very interesting series to, to to publish and get out there especially for those who didn't know this information before take care welcome to the learn true health podcast I'm your host Ashley James this is episode 461 I am so excited for today's guest. I've had Dr. Paul Thomas on the show. It was episode 224 back in February of 2018. Can you believe how much time has passed? I, I can't believe the whole, the world, can we, I, can we just get on a time machine and go back to 2018? <laughs> that would be, that'd be oh so gosh. great. Right? Yep. Well, thank you, Ashley, for having me on your show again. So much has happened in my life since early 2018. Oh my goodness. Well, when we had you on the show, you shared some amazing stories, and I have uh, I've always referred back to our episode together uh, because I, I like to try to stay neutral on on many topics that are controversial and allow the guests through science and and through um, real research help people to better understand their medical choices. Um, I yep. think that when we polarize a topic, we really become ignorant, right? Because making a choice that's emotional, making a medical choice based on a belief, right, that's uninformed, right. can right. end it can end up harming us. Or making a medical choice based on, well, my doctor just told me to, and and he created a lot of fear, and and my mom is or my mother in law is really pushing for it. And like when there's fear, emotion, and people are pushing us, or we feel peer pressure to make a medical decision for ourselves or our children, we we're not fully informed, and we we end up we end up paying the price. Yeah, and so no, many absolutely. Have. And Absolutely. What, what I love about what you do is you believe in true informed consent. And I really learned that from you on such a deep level. Um, I've actually had to say that to since you and I talked on the show in 2018, I've had to say that to several doctors. I want true, I want informed consent. And that they just stopped in their tracks and they switched gears. They're like, oh, okay. And it was great because I could see that they were like, oh, okay, this, I I can't just tell this person what to do. And I have to show them all of their options and really like go through. I actually had one doctor get very excited at my, my, my son ended up in children's hospital with um, respiratory distress. It was very scary. And, um, and I said before they, they stuck a needle in them to, to, for an IV for what they were actually giving a magnesium. I had no idea what they were doing. I'm like, I need informed consent. And she stopped and she got really excited. And she's like, oh, okay, great. Let me tell you, you know, this is what we're doing. This is the, uh, the side, you know, side of the possible side effects. This is the benefits. This is the alternatives. And she really walked me through it. And I'm like, wow, the doctor that wants you wants to give you true informed consent wants to empower you to make good choices to make the best choices that you can the doctors that get upset you that that's a doctor i'd be afraid of so i learned yeah. so much from you and our, our listeners learn so much from you i heard the other day from one of my friends who's in the medical field that you have been up against it and she heard you in another interview talk about um some very interesting things that have been going on and i've been watching you i follow you on facebook um, and I would love for you to share with the listeners what, what has uh, happened since 2018, since we had you on the show. Oh, my goodness. So uh, a lot. And I'll, I'll walk you through the, the, the key points. Um, thank you for highlighting informed consent. It is the ethical principle upon which all medical procedures should be judged. In other words, I mean, unless if you're going to die 
right in front of me. If I don't do something, you just jump in and do something, yes. right? But anything else, if you're if you're not at risk of dying in the real right now, then if I'm proposing a procedure or a treatment, uh, whether it be medication, surgery, vaccines, you deserve as a patient to be informed of the risks, the benefits, and the alternatives. And one of the alternatives for any medical procedure should always be putting it off, not doing it. So, because if I'm just here to coerce you, to convince you, to get you to do my procedure, that's not true informed consent, right? I mean, mm. you could kind of pretend like it is, but you, you, the consumer, you have to know that it is your option and you're not going to be judged. You're not going to be looked down upon. You're not going to be made to feel bad uh, if you choose not to follow the advice, right? So uh, doctors typically have what they think is best. And so generally we go with whatever our doctors say. But in the area of vaccines, which has been the world I'm most known for, I mean, I'm a general pediatrician. I also do addiction medicine. Uh, I, I really focus on preventative health and wellness. But the, the area that I've become well known for is this vaccine issue, which, like you said, is so polarizing. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason it's so polarizing is that the mainstream mantra that is funded by huge pharma dollars is the simple marketing slogan, vaccines are safe and effective. That, folks, is not a medical fact. It is a marketing slogan. But unfortunately, physicians, the public, everybody has just sort of adopted that as if it were a truth, as if that were science. So just to dispel that vaccines are safe and effective, because I'm not anti or pro-vaccine, just like I'm not anti or pro-antibiotics or any other procedure. We have to look at the specifics and individualize for the patient in front of us and go through the pros and the cons, risks, benefits, alternatives. So vaccines are safe. Well, that's obviously false. There is no safe medication, period. How risky a given vaccine is depends on the vaccine. And we'll probably get to this, but COVID is by far, the COVID vaccines, the most dangerous vaccines that have ever been brought to market. We have over 5,000 deaths already from the vaccines reported in VAERS, which we know catches about 1% to 2%, no more than 10% for sure of the adverse events. So we have a, it's more deaths than all other deaths for the past 30 years from all vaccines combined. Think about that. Can you say that again? <laughs> there are more deaths from the COVID vaccines than there are have been deaths from all other vaccines combined over the entire duration of the VAERS system, which is 30 years. This vaccine is so dangerous, it should be pulled from the market, in my opinion, and in the opinion of many physicians and scientists. But those opinions are silenced. You don't hear it on the news. And there is massive suppression of that sort of information because it just seems like this program has a life of its own and they don't seem to know how to pull back because they've invested, you know, I don't know, hundreds of billions of dollars or something, some massive amount. I mean, they're trying to vaccinate the planet with an experimental vaccine. Anyway, I went off on COVID vaccine a little too soon because <laughs> then be well, this, this guy's crazy. Um, <laughs> you know, folks, it's just, you got to look at the data and the data is, is very convincing. But let me walk you back through sort of my journey since we were last together. Uh, around, so in 2016, I wrote a book, The Vaccine Friendly Plan. And that book is not anti-vaccine or pro-vaccine. And in fact, I pissed everybody off with that book because the people, who, <laughs> the, the people who truly hate vaccines call me baby killer because I am recommending vaccines. And the people who are pro-vaccine hate me because I'm not recommending all the vaccines. Or I'm making it too complicated to follow the CDC schedule. People are not going to get all their vaccines, so therefore I'm harming public health. Well, that is the narrative that has been used by the Oregon Medical Board to come after me. And actually, since around the time you and I talked, uh, actually it was that month, I believe, maybe it was after we talked around that time, I got a notice from the Oregon Medical Board that said, prove... Uh, they'd already been hitting me with a few complaints. It's sort of like there's, uh, I know there's a, 
an, an effort to attempt to get rid of me. Let's just say it mm-hmm, that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, I am seen by some as dangerous for public, right? That if I'm causing patients not to follow the CDC schedule, and all I do is give informed consent. I tell people the, in, the, the risks, the benefits, the alternatives. And when you really get the truth about risks and benefits, some vaccines just plain don't make sense. The easy one is hepatitis B for newborns. Oh. So in America, every newborn in the hospital is given a, a, an injection of 250 micrograms of aluminum for a disease, hepatitis B, that you catch from sex and IV drug use. The babies in my practice, frankly, are not having sex and not sharing dirty needles. So unless their birth mother has hepatitis B, their risk for that disease is absolutely zero. Mm -hmm. The risk of injecting that much aluminum is known. It is fairly significant, uh, although it's not recognized. So that's the issue. Those of us who are aware that aluminum toxicity creates problems with your immune system, allergies and autoimmunity, we know that it affects neurodevelopment. The studies have been since 1990 and before there were studies about aluminum toxicity and how it harms neurodevelopment. So why would you cause something that's going to affect your baby's development and brain uh, for a disease they have zero risk for? So that's the kind of informed consent. When you as a parent are actually told those facts, I think I've had one patient out of the last 3,000 in my practice still want to get the hepatitis B vaccine. Wow. So you just, that one's so clear. Now, a lot of them are not so clear because they have risks, but they also have benefits. And that's where it gets muddied. And that's where in my book, The Vaccine Friendly Plan, I tried to sort of navigate that that whole issue. Um, Since then, however... So let me go back to the fact that the board asked me to prove that the vaccine friendly plan that I talked about in my book was as safe as the CDC schedule. So I get this letter from the medical board uh, and you have to produce, by the way, when the medical board comes after you, uh, if you refuse to cooperate, they just yank your license. So I hired a doctor to come into my office. He was a, a former pediatrician, neonatologist who had then morphed his career into medical record informatic systems. He had designed, I think, almost 50 informatic systems around the world. I mean, this guy's a nerd genius data guy. (laughs) So So he comes in. Just explain what that means. He takes, he's able to take all the records and he's able to quantify certain information or can you just like explain what, what it is he ends up producing? What he does. So, so I asked him to answer the following question. I, he came and spent a week in my office and the, the, the extracting data about vaccines is pretty complicated when you have different healthcare systems. We had, I had transferred patients from an old practice and our, our systems had changed from one to another. So it, it took him a, a lot more work because of that. Mm-hmm. But I basically asked him, identify every patient born into my practice. So this practice, Integrated Pediatrics, was opened in June of 2008. So at that time, we had 10 and a half years of data. And I said, find every patient born into the practice. We want patients who were were seen from birth because I get a lot of patients come into my practice because they've had other vaccine injuries and and they know that I will listen to them, Mm -hmm. whereas other practices will just kick them out if they don't follow the CDC schedule. Mm -hmm. So I attract a lot of higher risk families and I wanted a, a pure sample of just kids born into the practice. So that ended up being over 3,000 kids. And then I said, let's look at every vaccine they got, every single diagnosis they were given. And let's just plot out the data. Actually, he wasn't even going to plot out the data. His job was merely to find the data. He then had it de-identified by an honest broker so that when I sent that data set to my co-author, James Lyons Wheeler, he had no clue who was who. He was purely working from raw data. Now, the guy that came in, when he came in, he says, Paul, he was not really a believer that vaccines can cause harm. He was more of the old school, you know, vaccines are safe and effective. And I said, well, we'll see. I I mean, I honestly didn't know what we would find. After the first day, he came out like excited, like a kid in a candy store. And he's going, oh, my God, the data just jumps out at you. I said, what do you mean? He says, well, I'm not looking for the results, but you cannot you cannot not see it. The unvaccinated kids just don't get sick. They don't get anything. And so 
I knew there was some signal he was seeing, but then when we analyzed this data and we published it, we went, took it through peer review, the article for your listeners is called Relative Incidence of Office Visits and Cumulative Rates of Bill Diagnoses Along the Axis of Vaccination. It's published in the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health, published uh, November 18th, 2020. Now, that's a mouthful for a title, but I just wanted you to have it if you're looking it up. <laughs> uh, but basically, if you just if you just look for International Journal of Environmental Research, Public Health 2020, uh, I think you'll find it. Relative incidence of office visits and cumulative rates of bill diagnosis. Sorry about that. Maybe on, on your show you can give a link or something. I, th oh, I think I sent it. Yes. We, we actually uh, transcribe all of the interviews and put it on our, our website, learntrailth.com. So we'll make sure the link is there. Perfect. Perfect. So there, for those of you who go and get this article, which I highly recommend, see if you can print it out in color because we have a page of graphs all on one page. It's figure five, analysis five. And what it shows is for all the major conditions that, that were looked at in orange, you have over the that whole 10 years, the increase in diagnosis of the various conditions. So we've got asthma, allergic rhinitis, breathing issues, behavior problems, ADD, ADHD, ear infections, other infections, eye infections, eczema and dermatitis and urticaria, so skin problems and anemia. For every single one of the conditions, the orange line, which is your vaccinated kid, and by the way, these are children in my practice following the vaccine friendly plan. So they're getting about half the vaccines that a CDC schedule kid would get. But even then, when you compare them to the over 500 kids who were unvaccinated, and it was age matched, so we're, we're comparing kids of the same age, the unvaxxed kids just don't get these conditions. It's almost a flat line on blue and this rising level of problems for the vaccinated kids. I'm looking at the graph right now. I just, I just Googled it. I'm looking at, at figure five and it's unbelievable. It's, there's no question when you see this data. Yeah. Yeah. It, it just jumps out at you. And that's what he was, I think, seeing when he was just looking at raw data. I didn't expect it to be this dramatic. And here's the problem for, for, for listeners to understand. Doctors don't realize that these things have anything to do with vaccines. I mean, who would think that asthma or ear infections or ear pain, uh, dry skin or you know itchy skin or even anemia, who would ever have thought that they had anything to do with vaccines? It seems that they do. Mm -hmm. And we now have other studies. There's something called the control group that's just incredibly powerful. You go to controlgroup.org, I believe, thecontrolgroup.org. And they did a survey of what they found was a one quarter of 1% of Americans are totally unvaccinated. <gasps> one quarter of 1%. Wow. 90, 99.74% have had at least one vaccine. <clears throat> and that was mind boggling. And they surveyed 48 of the 50 states. They had a sample size of I think over 3000 surveys done. And when they looked at things like heart disease, cancer, the unvaxxed adults or diabetes, the unvaxxed adults had zero. No heart disease, no cancer, no diabetes, zero. And of course the incidence we know of heart disease in adults is somewhere around 40 50%, I believe, uh, diabetes, 10%. Um, people don't know that the chronic things for which you need medication could be related to vaccines because this has never been done. That's the tragedy of our health system. It has never, because of the, the sales marketing pitch of vaccines are safe and effective, they've never bothered to look. And where some of us are waking up to the fact that, whoa, we got a problem and we should be looking, right? So uh, yeah, that, that vaxxed unvaxxed study was published on November 18th, 2020. It was available online, first available online at the end of, um, end of November. <clears throat> and five days after it was available online, the Oregon Medical Board had a meeting emergency meeting and they immediately suspended my license to practice medicine. So, so they asked you for the proof, you gave them the proof and they still, they, they then took your license, they suspended your license yep. because you gave them the proof 
that they uh, asked for. There you go. I mean, obviously, I can't prove that they emergently suspended my license because I published this data, but it's pretty close to guaranteed proof because of the following. A week before that, or maybe it was two weeks before that, they had just sent a new complaint that was absolutely ridiculous. They've been sending me new complaints that are anonymous, by the way, so we don't know where they're coming from, who's initiating these complaints. The um, pharmaceutical company could be. <laughs> I don't know who, I'll tell you. But they, they've been endless. I would say uh, the last two, three years, I get complaints every other month. Uh, wow. And they and I have to address them, and so I I get dig for the data that they're asking for and give it to them. Never hear back. So they've never filed any charges. Just they're fishing, right? So they're they complain after complaint. So we were already in the process of of trying to respond to a, another complaint, yet another complaint, when this emergency happened. Well, what was the emergency? Nothing had changed. My patients are the healthiest patients in town, and I've got mm -hmm. data to prove it now that's been published in a peer-reviewed journal. So where's the emergency? Mm -hmm. So you can only – there can only be one explanation in my opinion. Uh, so uh, we have other good news to report. Just a couple weeks ago, I got – my attorney took this uh, – their situation of yanking my license without making any charges, which is basically illegal. And he took it to a judge, and the judge ruled in our favor, and the board actually just two weeks ago gave me back my license. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, this was not um, – they had already the, – the loss of my license caused me to lose all health insurance contracts. Um, mm. So I, I don't have health insurance. I don't have insurance contracts. I, I lost my board certification from both Board of Addiction Medicine and the Academy of Pediatrics, and I haven't worked for the last six months. Uh, it's taken a huge toll on our practice. Uh, we're still open. Thank thankfully, I have three, um, four actually, but three mostly working in the trenches, nurse practitioners who are doing an incredible job of taking care of the patients, but it's, it's, it's not been easy. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. When we spoke, I thought you also had a few doctors and a naturopath that worked with you. Do you, do you I did. So you, you, you and I talked when I, at that point, I, there was 10 of us in the office. Mm -hmm. So we had a naturopath who was just amazing. Uh, I had uh, three, I think we were three doctors and five nurse practitioners. Yep. A naturopath, uh, 10 in total. Uh, we're down to, if you count me, we're down to four with uh, one nurse practitioner doing a tiny bit of fill in here and there. Did did, were you on? Are you not? I know, I know with Washington State, there's some weird law where like you have to be a doctor to employ doctors or something. I, I don't quite understand it. But did, did weren't they, were they not allowed to be employed by the clinic because you lost your license or why did they leave? Uh, they most of them left in fear. So, oh my gosh! Yeah, that the, they were targeting my, me, and and it looked like they were starting to target the practice. So one of my nurse practitioners is just a lovely, lovely lady. Oh my gosh! Uh, but she was young, and she was she had gotten her PhD or or whatever the doctorate level for nurse practitioners was, uh, and she had a, ambitions to teach, and so she just had to move on because it was just too risky for her career. And I had another doctor who just left. It was just too risky for her career. She still had young children. Um, yeah, it's it's a lot of pressure that doctors who mm -hmm. speak up for informed consent are. I mean, the, what's happening in California? It's just any doctor who's written um, exemptions for vaccines mm -hmm. is is having to fight for their license. I mean, it's just oh. a, it's like a witch hunt. Wow. Yeah. I have so I have a friend who's a, actually he's a listener, and we became friends, and they contacted your office, um, but it wouldn't it wouldn't make sense to have a a, a medical exemption written f in Oregon if he's in California, but his son has had major problems, ma surgeries, and and uh, based on his history of his, of his uh, of his past, and the kid is I think six now because he's about the same age as, as my son. He um, just based on ev all of the health conditions he's gone through and is currently going through. Um, he's a candidate for exemptions right now uh, because his immune system is, you know, compromised. There's all these other things. And because they're in California, he can't find anyone to, no. even though there's, if he were to go to any other state, 
a pediatrician would say, absolutely, this is not a candidate right now for a vaccine because he's compromised. His body is, is this, this, you know, you're saying there are effects. I, I don't even like the term side effects. Yeah, it's, effects. There yeah. are effects of Negative certain effects. medications. Yep. And when a person is compromised, those effects are, are more dramatic. Yeah. The, the, the problem is uh, somehow pharma has captured the CDC. And so the CDC makes recommendations. They also make money on vaccines and they also are kind of a marketing arm in a, in a real sense mm -hmm. for vaccines uh, based on what data they choose to collect and then what data they choose to publish. Uh, but they've, the CDC has never done any of the research that's necessary to answer the question as I did, for example, comparing vaccinated to unvaccinated and what they've, right. what, yeah, what doctors are under your, your friend, uh, that was hoping for an exemption, I would actually guess that 90 some percent close to 100% of pediatricians would not write an exemption, even though it sounds like there's pretty strong evidence that that would be a mistake to vaccinate that child with all that's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, either because they truly believe vaccines are safe and effective, they, in a way, have, uh, they drank the Kool-Aid. I mean, they're just not doing their own research. Or in this day and age, it's career suicide. I mean, if, if you write medical exemptions, you're waving a big old flag to the medical board, come get me. And, you know, unless you're close to retirement, that's just not an option for, for a young doctor who's trying to build a career and maybe feed their family. Wow. That's, that's actually something I wanted to bring up, uh, was talking about sa safety testing. But first, I, I wanted to point out, I loved that on our interview, near the end of our interview, back in 2018, episode 224, you shared a story you, and at that time in February, you know, it's the tail end of quote unquote flu season. And right. at the time in the Pacific Northwest, where I'm, I'm up in Washington state. So in the Pacific Northwest, we had a really bad flu outbreak. Uh, my family didn't get it, but in all of the clinics, all of the hospitals, it was like a four or five hour wait. There was, they were just full and down in, in Oregon as well. You guys had four to five hour waits in the emergency rooms and clinics were just full. It was, a, a, we got hit really bad with, with some kind of form of influenza. And you said to me, Last Friday, our clinic closed early because we didn't get one phone call, not one phone call from, <laughs> I think you said 10,000 patients, Yeah. not yeah. one phone call from 10,000 patients saying, you know, my, my son, Johnny has a flu, has a fever and sniffles and you know, I need to come in or, or what should I do? You didn't get one phone call from all your patients. Yeah. And that, and you said about 50% of your practice, I think you said was unvaccinated and the other, the other percentage w would follow the, not the CDC schedule, but would follow the, the, what's laid out in your book, which is one at a time, wait and see, how does the kid react? Um, yeah. and, and then I said, well, what do you, what do you guys do for the, for the unvaccinated children, for those that choose to not do it? What, what do the parents do to help keep a child healthy? And you said, well, all my patients take vitamin D. They all, you know, get outside into sunlight, get fresh air and, and exercise. They all eat very clean, very healthy fruits and vegetables. I think you went down a list of everything that you make sure all your patients, regardless of vaccine status, you make sure they all, you know, follow these guidelines Huh. Well, it's they're recommended. I'm not sure how well <laughs> they're <you> know, followed. <laughs> yeah, li lifestyle is tough, right? I mean, it is for adults. You're supposed to, you know, exercise, not drink, eat healthy, and you get your sleep. And how many of us are perfect on that? Uh, but no, you're you're absolutely right. We to this day are. I have two waiting rooms, a well and a sick side, because at my old practice before I started this one, there was this one giant waiting room, and it was always like three quarters filled with sick kids. And you have these little well babies and well kids sitting amongst, you know, coughing, sneezing, snotty nose, what right. have you, feverish kids, something. This is not good. You're, you're exposing the healthy kids to so much stuff. I mean, it's like stay away from the pediatric office. So I set this up with two separate, completely separate waiting rooms. Our sick waiting room almost never has anybody in it. It was true back then. And of course, it's really been true with quarantine. Quarantine 
for sure, for most practices, reduced the volume of visits just in general. Uh, how much of that was just, you know, people wouldn't come in for fear of being exposed to somebody with COVID or that they truly weren't sick? I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, the fact that people were not in school, we know as a pediatrician, once school opens, just give it a few weeks and we get busy. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the states that had, you know, no uh, direct patient contact, patient, uh, student contact schooling. So if it was completely at home schooling, it definitely reduced illness. But the other thing was that happened with COVID is we had what I'm going to call diagnostic substitution. So traditionally in the United States, the CDC has reported there's, oh, I would say from 30 to 60,000 cases of influenza in the U S per day, per year. Mm hmm as a practicing busy pediatrician, I can tell you that probably at most 10% of those cases were actually influenza. It's usually less than 5%, but definitely no more than 10%. How can I say that? Well, it's reported by the CDC, that's the case. But when we get a really sick kid in the winter and they've got cough, fever, maybe a little sore throat, um, a body aches, a flu-like illness, today you would call it COVID, probably not even see them, right? You don't want to bring that patient into the office. You just assume it's COVID. Mm. But back then, before COVID, you would bring these sickest kids in to sort of figure out what's going on because they could have bacterial pneumonia and there are antibiotics for that. And so you want to know who, who needs to be treated or are they so sick they need to be in the hospital? Maybe they have an, a requirement for oxygen. Mm -hmm. So those sickest kids, we would do the last few years, we were doing something called a recipe path where you would actually swab the nose and send that off to test for maybe 20 different most common things that would cause an infection in a kid. And it would include influenza A, influenza B, um, rhinovirus and the various cold viruses, even coronavirus was on that panel before COVID came around, um, the bacterial causes, etc. And that's why I know at the height of flu season back then, five to 10% max every. And so now I'll bet you it's similar with COVID, even though it can be a very devastating illness for those who are high risk, it's no big deal for kids. So if a kid comes in with flu like symptoms, if we could test them for COVID and use a proper test, not the uh, PCR test that's high, high cycles of amplification, we can talk about that. That's giving so many false positives. But if we had a real test, the those with a flu-like COVID-like illness, I'll bet you it's less than 5% who are actually COVID, mm -hmm. right? So we just changed. So now all the people that used to be labeled as flu because that supported the flu shot campaign, mm. now we're labeling them as COVID because that supports the COVID shot campaign. Mm. The truth of the matter is do that panel of 20 tests and you've got some mycoplasma in there, you got some pneumococcus, you got some rhinovirus, some adenovirus, uh, some different coronavirus, you've got uh, RSV, parainfluenza, pertussis, uh, influenza A, influenza B. There's a long list of things that are causing that person's symptoms, but we don't bother to figure it out anymore. Right now, you're just said, stay home until you get better. If you get really bad, go to the hospital. Um, that's not good medicine, folks. That kind of blows my mind because we're told flu season, quote unquote, flu season. It's just a bunch of influenzas and that's it. But really, it's all, all it's only ever been five to 10 percent. And the other infections are d different bacteria or viruses. And, yeah. and that that marketing, it's right. We're marketed to. We, yep. but I remember yep. when the flu shot came out, I was a teenager and and it, the marketing, I, I I grew up in Canada, and the marketing was was big. It was all like you know happy people dancing in a field and, and downhill <laughs> yep. skiing, and you know uh, get the get the flu shot, prevent the flu. And I even got the shot. I, I think I was nineteen. I got it at my chiropractor's office of all things. She was so excited. Free flu shots, or maybe it was twenty five dollars. I don't remember, but it was like really she was so excited it was so innovative it was so new and and my mom and I who we never got sick i don't know why we were excited about the flu shot i guess we totally bought the marketing but my mom and i never ever got the flu ever i don't even remember having the flu my entire life and yep. then um 
after that shot, my mom and I were so sick, so sick. Yeah. And we turned to each other about a week later and said, never again are we going to get this <laughs> shot. This is ridiculous. What were we thinking? Yeah. And and that's what I started to go, that's interesting. It just kind of just, it made me question a little bit. And then when my mom was dying in the hospital of um, a medication the week before she died, she was in the hospital the last two weeks of her life. And I was there with her. I had the radio on and they announced on the news that the medication she had been on, that her doctor feared her into taking, it was a synthetic estrogen. Mm. And and her doctor said, if you don't take this, your bones are going to be brittle and you're just going to break a hip and die, basically. I remember yeah. my mom, who was the strongest woman I knew, came home in tears, crying, oh my goodness. needing to get on this medication because her doctor told her she was going to have brittle bones and die if she didn't oh take my it. Goodness. And then a few years later, she she's dying in the hospital of, of cancer. And it was this drug was taken off the market for causing an insane amount of cancer in women. Yeah. He, and the doctor that prescribed it got cancer too, because she was on it, because she believed the marketing. Yeah, yeah. And that oh, the doc doctors believe it themselves. Right, they do. They do. They're, they're very. I mean, they have conviction around it as well. And so that really made us something in my brain switch. And I'm like, I was I'm I was raised to blindly trust the marketing, yeah. blindly yeah. trust it. To, to, to get excited about drugs. Like, oh, this is going to make me better. This is going to help me. Now, I, 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 when, if I have an infection and, and I can't fight it, you know, naturally and it's getting bad, then yes, I definitely want, I want, I want allopathic medicine at my side. But when we go to a, a doctor with symptoms that are symptoms of nutrient deficiency, symptoms of lifestyle issues, you know, and we're put on medication after medication after medication, it's, this is a this is a system that's failing us, especially when we look at statistically the 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 number one and two and three causes of death in the United States. These these things aren't getting better, and we're medicating no. them more and more and more, and they're not getting better. Yeah. But when we t and I have interviewed so many holistic minded doctors who have amazing results, like you do with your patients, who have outstanding results. And have published these results with reversing chronic illness and preventing disease with natural medicine. Yep. So, so in my mind, it's like if if I could help the listeners to think critically and not by the marketing, and yeah. and and I, I don't want to say never get X X drug, never take. You know, I, I'm not. That's the, the the whole black and white thing. That doesn't work either. It's, it's dogmatic. But right. they're being dogmatic and saying always blindly trust this and take it. And I'm saying use critical thinking, definitely read Dr. Paul Thomas's book and use critical thinking and look at his studies and see that we need to question everything, everything we put into our body. Like yep. pe people will question a supplement. If you recommend a supplement, they'll be like, well, who, who manufactured it? And you know, what are the safety studies? Uh, but then, but then they'll just go and blindly trust a doctor with, with a medication. So yep. we have we have to use critical thinking with everything with our with our with where our food comes from too nowadays you know there's oh my goodness absolutely right? there's GMO potato I had a whole episode with uh, uh, Jeffrey Smith who's an advocate for non GMO and he yeah. talked about um, apples and potatoes are now GMO and yeah. um, and so it's not just you know corn and soy. And these things are having major health problems, major yeah. health problems, it destroying the microbacteria or the bacteria of the gut, the microbiome of the gut. And the, micro, the microbiome of the gut produces our serotonin, um, uh, produ uh, converts, it actually helps convert some of our thyroid, uh, T, T, I think it's T4 into T3. There's like, all right, if we don't have a healthy microbiome, we begin to just lose health on all fronts and, yeah. and, and GMOs are causing that. So to not to go off on tangent, but just to say that we really need to question everything and educate ourselves on everything we put in our body, clean water, clean food, even when it comes to medication and supplements, we have to, we have to do our, re, our own, um, footwork basically. Yeah. What's always, what's always, uh, I guess confused me. We were told that that vaccines are safe because they're tested. They're safety. There must be safety studies, right? Like, I mean, drugs are tested for years. <laughs> every every drug. Now, my mom died of this, so every drug that was approved to be given to patients, right, in Canada, in the states, any country, 
every so I'm going to use the the FDA as an example for the for America, but every drug that's been approved, uh, that every drug that's been taken off the market for 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 doing harm was was also first approved. So these right. drugs that have then been rescinded, the drug yep. that was rescinded off the market for killing my mother and killing other women was approved at one point. We have to remember that. Yeah. Uh, you know that so that's like just that alone we should start to just question things more instead of blindly blindly follow them. But you know in my mind I always thought that vaccines were tested were aren't they safety tested for years like like drugs are safety tested and don't they do double blind studies cuz that's their thing right double blind studies. Um and then I heard somewhere that that vaccines are not safety tested with double blind placebo studies. They don't do a placebo that's uh, inert. Can you Correct. can you um, explain that? And so what I mean is, like you think they're injecting water or saline solution into someone's arm, and they're the placebo trial, and then they're injecting the actual vaccine to the other person. But that's not the case. If they were to right. take people and just inject saline versus a vaccine, then they actually might might show how the negative effects like you said with theirs the negative effects far outweigh the 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 the, the inert placebo so what is what how do they quote unquote do safety tests it's a how do they study the safety bef before they release it to the public so awesome question the problem with vaccine science and research when it comes to safety testing is they have very cleverly gotten completely away from using a true placebo, which would be an injection of just salt water, saline, which is at the same concentration as your blood or plasma. And so on, on one group, you would have the vaccine and on the other group, you would have saline. So the trick they use is in the case of aluminum, which we know is extremely problematic, uh, they'll just give aluminum instead of saline and then the vaccine will be the vaccine antigen plus the aluminum and their side effects are look oh they're the same therefore the vaccine's safe i call that tobacco science so for example um ashley why don't you smoke one pack a day i'm going to smoke two packs a day and, and we'll have a third group smoke none and we'll see who died in a week nobody died so it's safe and that highlights the second problem with vaccine research which is the duration of the study, how long do they follow these people, is very short. Mm -hmm. Much too short to pick anything up other than a little redness at the injection site. And so that's why they say, oh, it's one in a million to have bad side effects, except, you know, of course you're going to get a little redness where you got your shot and it'll be a little sore. Uh, they completely, intentionally don't look for long-term side effects. Uh, autoimmunity and allergies take years sometimes to develop, they're never going to pick that up. So they, they don't use proper placebo, they're not double blind controlled studies, and they're not long enough. And, and that whole phenomenon creates a situation where really, oh, a couple other huge things, because the belief, almost like a religion, is that vaccines are safe and effective, they don't look at all health outcomes. They only look for a few things that they know are known side effects from vaccines. So in my research, for example, they would never be looking for asthma or behavioral issues or ADD or ADHD or allergies or breathing problems or ear infections or ear pain or eczema. Or they don't recognize these things as related to vaccines. So they'll, if you don't look, you don't find. So the trials are set up specifically to look at a certain set of things and then they shut off the trials before there's a chance for there to be any difference in the two groups. They can say, look, the two groups are similar, so the vaccines are safe. <sighs> there's another problem. <laughs> if you are funding a study, so I'm a pharmaceutical company, let's say, and I'm going to study uh, product X. Let's say I set it all up. I want to show that product X is going to help you live healthier. And so we get going with this study and it's not going well. It's not looking like this study is going to help. Generally, we're just going to abandon that research. You know, this, this research isn't working. Uh, we, we must have designed it wrong. Uh, we're not going to do this research. And sometimes they'll even get to the point of publication and why would they publish it? It's going to harm their product. 
Mm-hmm. So the, the people funding the research obviously have a desire for a certain outcome. And when they get the outcome they like, they publish it. If they don't, they often don't publish it. Worse than that, they also are money. Pharma money has infiltrated the academic institutions, universities, uh, all the PhDs who are doing research in their labs have to apply for grants so they can fund the research. Most of these grants are coming from somehow pharmaceutical money. And you don't get a grant unless you're researching something that they're interested in. They have never, ever, ever yet funded a true vaxxed, unvaxxed study. This is why my published study is so important because there was no funding. We just did this. And <laughs> then the, the next set of problems comes. If you ever get something published, which we did with a very – rigorous peer review process, they try to get it retracted. And in fact, we are under right now review. Somebody complained and said, well, our methodology is new. It's not valid. Well, the reason they were complaining is we did it the old way, which is, do you have the disease or not? Right? So if we looked at asthma or ADHD or autism or whatever, uh, it was just a yes, no. That's how most research is done. Well, what we did in this research is we looked at every single diagnosis, even how many times it happened. So if you're in the study and you're seen once in your lifetime for an asthma attack, compare that to a child who's had 20 visits for an asthma attack. That shows an increased severity. Mm -hmm. And so what the way we designed this study, we, we did it the old way. We, we analyzed it that way, and it was significant in a few things. But when you look at severity, it's highly significant. So we also published this as sort of a shot across the bow for future researchers saying, look at all health outcomes and look at all visits so you can pick up severity. Mm. So it's, it's, a really, it's a really clever design, but it's new. And people who want to try to discredit research they don't want anything new if it's going to show what they're trying to protect in a bad light. That's that's amazing. I, I like your way much better because it's showing the severity. That makes so much sense. Instead of this black or white, they have it or they don't have it. Well, right. how many times did they have that incident occur You know, over a period of time shows the severity. That, 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 that just seems like uh, that makes so much more sense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and you, you, you really spent the extra time to go into it, and and it's I, I love that that guy came in like you know believing one thing and then the the numbers don't lie, right? Yeah, exactly. The numbers the, don't the, lie. It's data, and 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 when people take offense to data that's been peer reviewed and well researched, <laughs> what's so ironic is that as we pointed out in the beginning of this interview, this was the data they asked for. Yep. And and uh, they sure didn't like what they found. Um, yeah, we we also I we also published another study that I'll just mention. It's it's a short little paper. Well, it's actually it's not that short, but it's uh it's called Vaccine Practice Payment Schedules Create Perverse Incentives for Unnecessary Medical Procedures at What Cost to Patients. So this was published in the International Journal of Vaccine Theory, Practice and Research. Basically what we did was I took a month's worth of data from my practice back in an August September a year ago. Mm-hmm. And we looked at every single super bill. In other words, everybody that walked through the door for that month. And on the back of my super bills, I have a vaccine refusal form because we're so meticulous about documenting informed consent that anytime vaccines are discussed, we flip that page, page, the super bill over. It's just a piece of paper that we click off what we're doing that day, right? So the billing people can double check that we they bill appropriately for what was done. Mm -hmm. That's all our super bill is. So on the one side, you're just checking, like say they got a CBC to check for anemia or they got a breathing treatment for asthma. We just check off what we've done. And then on the flip side though, is this checklist of all the vaccines that we could possibly give. And we go through and say, well, looking at your vaccine status, you're behind on this vaccine. Here's what other pediatricians would tell you to do so that you're following the CDC schedule. And the patients either agree to do them or they refuse them. So we had the ability to actually tabulate which vaccines were given for an entire month by which company, because some insurance companies pay better than others. So, I mean, this was real world data, Mm -hmm. the vaccines that were accepted and done and the vaccines that should have been done if you were following the CDC schedule, but were refused. Mm -hmm. And then we extrapolated that for 12 months. 
and learned that our practice of about 10,000 patients where we bill out about 3 million, well, before all this happened to me, it was about 3 million. It's dropped to about 2 million now. But our gross billings was about 3 million. Mm -hmm. We have 30 some employees. At that point, we had close to 10 providers. For a practice billing out 3 million, we were losing over a million dollars in just administration fees. You can't survive as a practice if you're losing a quarter to a third of your overhead because pediatric practices run about 70, 80% overhead. Okay. So no wonder I haven't been able to give my employees a raise. I think they got one raise in the last 10 years. It is uh, it is a service of love by everybody that's working in my practice because we believe in what we're doing. We're helping kids. And yeah, money's tight when you're not getting vaccine money. Uh, you know, if I'm leaving a million dollars on the table for the last 13 years, uh, that's $13 million. My employees could have had nice raises and bonuses and I'd probably be, uh, doing just fine. Right. I'm the sole owner of this practice. Uh, I haven't taken a paycheck in six months. So, um, the vaccine compensation is, is set up in such a way that it is so, enticing. Uh, and pediatricians deny this. I used to deny it. I used to say, oh, no, 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 we don't make any money on vaccines. Uh, and that's because the markup that most practices do on vaccines is very, very low. If I buy a vaccine for $100, I might charge you $103 or $105 for it. I'm not making a massive amount of profit on selling vaccines. But the insurance companies give you this payment that's called administration fee. And it's over a thousand dollars in the first year of a baby's life. So, so one baby, I'm getting over a thousand dollars in just the administration fees by the time they're age one. For keeping them on the CDC schedule. Yep, if you follow the CDC schedule. How many so, babies does a pediatrician typically have in their practice? Well, a busy pediatrician like I am, I would get about thirty babies a month. I'd say the average is more like five to ten, maybe. Um, so it's five it just, to ten grand a month, some upwards of thirty thousand dollars a month. If if a pediatrician were to vaccinate one hundred percent of their um, infants each month, that's just the admin fee. You still get paid to see the patients. Oh yeah, and, no, but you know, it, like like let's say a, a pediatrician gives zero vaccines versus versus one hundred percent of the of the CDC schedule. So the, so so doc, pediatricians are incentivized between if they see only five to 10 babies a month, it's five to 10 grand a month, you know, in their pocket from keeping uh, them on year. the CDC no, that per, was year? per year. Okay. Yeah. Per, but uh, per month, they see five to 10 new babies per month. Yes. So if they see five to 10 new babies per month, then it's five to 10 grand a month. It, oh, it, I see what you're saying. Yep. Right. And so if it's 30, I see, I see 30, how you're doing the math. Yep. If, if it's 30,000 babies a month for, for you, because you're busy, then that's $30,000 a month for keeping them on the CDC schedule versus a pediatrician who who does informed consent and only attracts parents who who wish to not vaccinate 100%. Right. Yeah. So so that is it's significant. Huge. It's huge. And 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 pediatricians deny that they're incentivized by money. And I think honestly they don't know. I just got this published uh last this past year in October of 2020. Um yeah, it's uh or wait a minute, when was this published? I was looking at the wrong article. This was March of 21. That's right. I knew it was more recent. So we just got this published two, three months ago. Um, yeah, it, I don't think pediatricians are aware that uh, here's the here's the, the funny thing. Not funny. It's the reality in my town. Almost every other pediatrician will not see you unless you follow the CDC schedule. So that is now uh, a process that the Academy of Pediatrics says is okay ethically. Oh In other words, you, you, can, you can kick people out of your practice if they won't follow the CDC schedule. However, there is a little caveat. They have to have alternative care available. So here's the funny thing. They're trying to take my license away because I'm honoring informed consent, but I'm the only place these people can go. So if they shut me down, they're not going to be able to kick these people out. <laughs> it's it's kind of weird. Um, but they're kind of financially, they are getting to benefit from getting rid of the patients that kind of cost. It costs you money. If you see patients and they're not vaccinating, it's actually costing you money because the overhead is so high. 
So, so let's get these patients who aren't bringing us in the profits. We'll send them over to Dr. Paul at Integrated Pediatrics. We'll keep the ones that are lucrative. And uh, they're not thinking that way, but that is the reality. You, you got to imagine some of them have figured it out. <laughs> Maybe. The, I'll tell you what, the office managers know. I remember uh, back when my old office, uh, back in the early 2000s, when we figured out that we were injecting too much mercury, because a lot of the vaccines had mercury in there to prevent fungal infections in those multi-dose vials. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was data accumulating that that was causing health problems and probably linked to certain cases of autism. Wait and a second. Mer mercury is not healthy for you? <laughs> it's not. I think that was called Mad Hatter's disease or something. Right. And the chimney sweeps would get too much mercury. Um, yeah, no, mercury is not healthy for you. You're absolutely right, Ashley. Good, 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 good memory there. <laughs> I, I mean, think about it. The old thermometers, I don't, you're not old enough to remember. Oh, I probably. played with, no, no, no. I, I, uh, <laughs> I, I went to Mexico once and they used to, I mean, I went to Mexico with my family when I was a kid and they, um, back in, I don't know, 80s, 90s. And they, yeah. they used to sell, I don't know if they still do, this glass jewelry yeah. that had mercury in it. And I like oh, broke, broke right. one and played with it, you know, because yep. it was like, it was like the Terminator. Remember the guy yeah. would turn into like mercury. Mercury and I was like touching it and rolling it around, playing with it. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Mer yeah mercury so is not healthy. <laughs> mercury is a liquid metal, but it is not good for you. Uh, anyway, um, where was I going with that? So the they they were it, it, you figured oh, out the I amount of mercury. Was. Yeah. So so I I went to my office manager and I said as I heard they were going to get the mercury out of the vaccines. So I went to my office manager at the time and I said, as soon as we get options to get the vaccines that don't have mercury, please, please, let's get those instead of the mercury ones. And she said to me, well, they just came up, became available, but are you willing to pay the $6,000 extra it's going to cost to buy the newer, more expensive ones? Because your partners aren't willing. <sighs> and I was like, at that time, I was a younger pediatrician with a huge family to feed. And no, I couldn't do that. They wanted me to pay for the difference for everybody. Uh, so we kept on using the, the inferior vaccine until they were no longer available. And that was an economic decision. And unfortunately, uh, pediatrics and medicine in general is a business, just as pharmaceutical companies are a business. And sometimes you're making decisions that are more important for your business bottom line than are really in the absolute best interest of your patients. And so folks, if you're listening, parents, if we're talking about making vaccine decisions for your children, you're the last hope that your child has that you will save them, that you will protect them. They don't have the choice that you take them into a pediatrician. The pediatrician says, this is what you should do. And if they're if you're not protecting them, if you're not doing your research, then you, you know, unfortunately, they are at the mercy of, of the system. And you, you were so right, Ashley, earlier to point out, this is a sick care system. It's not a wellness system. Our bodies are naturally capable of being very healthy if we stay away from toxins. So you, you mentioned it near the beginning. Drink filtered water. Don't eat pesticides and herbicides. Make sure you've got non-GMO, if possible, organic food. And avoid injected toxins, which is your vaccines. I'm not telling anybody what to do with vaccines. This is just educational and informational conversation we're having here. But folks, look into it. When you really look at the research, vaccines are not safe. They're borderline effective, depending on which vaccine. And exercise, take vitamin D. You cannot get enough unless you're living at the equator with your clothes off. Uh, I mean, we <laughs> I'd just, love to do that. Let's go to the equator and wouldn't that be eat nice? mangoes naked. Yeah. <laughs> I, that sounds good to me. Uh, count me in. I, I, I never could bring myself to go to those nude beaches, but um, yeah, it sounds like a good thing anyway. Uh, so, so there are things we can do to be healthy and mostly it's just letting nature the way it was beautifully designed keep you healthy it if if you want to pivot a little bit more to covid i do want to talk about it yeah. a little bit all right okay so i mean so, we were doing a catch-up from everything that happened since our last interview and yeah. i i love everything you put you you've discussed so far i did see a few a few times on facebook you talking about masking children and that's been something that that is so cringy to me. 
Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I, I'd love for you to touch on that at some point. Sure. So, so the mask issue I can touch on quite simply. Masks, the medical ones that we use in hospitals, were not designed to prevent viral particles from going back and forth. They were designed to make sure the surgeon doesn't sneeze on the operating field uh, or, you know, drool or whatever, right? To try to keep the, 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 the operating field where you, where you clean the belly. Let's say you're doing an abdominal surgery. You clean it really good, scrub, scrub, betadine, drape it with sterile drapes, and then you're cutting the abdomen open. You don't want a surgeon leaning over and sneezing or dripping into the surgical site. I mean, that's the purpose of those masks. They are very ineffective at preventing viruses of the size of COVID, the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes uh, COVID-19. Uh, that virus can get through those masks so easily, it's kind of a joke to, to think that that's going to protect you. It's like Those a bumblebee flying through a chain link fence. Exactly. And certainly if you're talking about the cloth masks, it definitely is like a fly or a bumblebee going through a chain link fence. It's just completely almost worthless. In fact, it's probably worse than worthless because what you're doing is you're creating moisture that's trapping things. And so you may actually be creating more risk for yourself than benefit. So that being said, if I was a very high risk person and I was truly scared of coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 virus, I would probably wear an N95 and a face shield when I was going to be in close proximity to other people, right? So if you are yourself afraid, there's something you can do and, and do it. I mean, if that's going to help you be able to go shopping, uh, put an N95, make sure it fits nice and tight and put a face shield over that. And I think you'll be fine, except be careful to wash your hands before you touch anything that's going back home with you. Uh, because I think the virus does have capability of going from your hands and then you touch your face or whatever and you get it onto yourself. So that's masks. Children don't need them for a couple reasons. One, they don't work. And two, well, lots of reasons. Two, they're more risky than they're beneficial. Most studies are showing that. Uh, so there's plenty of garbage studies that show benefit, folks. Remember, that's pharma trick or whatever. You, whoever's got an agenda we want people to mask up can fund a study that'll show benefit. It's so easy to do studies like that. So, But good studies show that they're not only mostly worthless, but they're actually probably causing more harm than good. One of the harms that has not been well studied, I think I've read one or two articles about this, is when you mask up children and now they're, they're not being exposed to facial expressions, to smiles, mm. to, to, to the ability. I mean, we're social creatures. We're supposed to be interacting in a loving, uh, supportive way with one another. You become a little robot almost. And, and then you add the fact that we've kept kids at home in front of screens before COVID hit. My number one problem in teenagers was anxiety and depression. It was triggered by screens. I, I mean, that was crystal clear to me. Now we add COVID and isolation and so much more screen time. And we wonder why we're having increases in ADD, anxiety, suicides. It's, it's a disaster. Now, when we know that children, the risk of a child, unless they happen to have severe underlying medical conditions, most children their risk of dying from COVID is less than one in 100,000. I mean, they just don't get seriously ill. Of course, the news is going to report those rare cases and get everybody afraid. So fear is what they're selling. Uh, the strategy was we're going to mask everybody up. We're going to isolate everybody and get them so tired of it that when we come through with a vaccine as the savior, they're going to line up. And it's worked. I mean, we're getting so many people vaccinated and it's, it's truly tragic, especially now that they're starting to target children. Parents, the science is in. It's crystal clear. You're not hearing it on the news, however, because the news has already been bought and paid for. Um, you can go to the High Wire, Del Bigtree, his show. You can go to my show, Against the Wind, Doctors and Science Under Fire. You can go to the Children's Health Defense and look at their uh, daily news called The Defender and get all the science and all the information you need to understand that, oh, my Lord. The science has been done. This is a very dangerous vaccine. It probably 
is time. Dr. McCullough was on my show twice already. He's a mainstream doctor that's probably the most uh, published physician in the United States who's also treating COVID. Mm -hmm. And he's he's now calling for a, a total, uh, the program needs to be abandoned, mm -hmm. that this this is no longer safe for humans. So we're, we're at a turning point and it's not too late to save the children, okay? The adults who, if you've already gotten this vaccine, I don't want you to be afraid because fear does not help your immune system. So if you've already gotten the vaccine and you start to have any new symptom, don't discount it as being unrelated to the vaccine. Just see a physician or, or a healthcare provider who, who understands natural healing processes. Um, and then you, you'll see we give at the end of my show, every, every two weeks I've got a, the show, just go to doctorsinscience.com. At the very end of each show, we give you resources. And you can use those same resources that are to treat a COVID-19 infection to treat the side effects, right? Because the, the, the spike protein in this, in this uh, vaccine is what's causing the mischief. And you can get exposed to the spike protein from the infection, but you also get exposed from the vaccine. And so my best guess is, because we're going to have, have an interesting fall and winter. I mm. have a feeling, based on what I'm reading in the research, is it appears that those who've gotten the vaccine are actually going to be at greater risk of problems mm -hmm. than those who did not. Uh, just like my data showed, natural immunity appears to be superior. So whether it's a new strain that comes through, they're having trouble in India and England and across you know different parts of the world with new variants, they're calling them. I think the unvaccinated will do much better against new variants than, than the vaccinated, uh, although time will tell, right? But the good news is there are treatments that work, whether you're vaccinated or unvaccinated. So don't despair. But please, if you're a parent, uh, they are pushing hard on the teenagers. I'm hearing stories already of peer pressure, big mm -hmm. peer pressure to, to get the vaccine. And well, they're universities, doing... universities yep. say are yep. saying that they have to vaccinate if they want to attend class. Yep, it's it's the pressure is immense. They're they're now talking about rolling out passports. Uh, vaccine passports to me is kind of like apartheid South Africa. I grew up in Southern Africa as a kid. And if you were white, you could move about freely. You had total access to the country. If you were not white, you had to carry papers just like a, <gasps> just like a passport. And you, if you didn't have your papers, you couldn't enter certain parts of cities. Uh, you, it was, that's where we're headed with the vac. This is like, don't call it a vaccine passport, call it a slavery passport. I mean, it is. It is ridiculous that you would take the, the least risky people are those who aren't vaccinated. OK, this is clear from my research on all illnesses, but it's becoming clear with COVID as well. So it's the unvaccinated who should be given free reign there. You're at no risk from them or let's not say no risk. That was an exaggeration. There's risk everywhere, but less risk because the unvaccinated are not as likely to get sick. Their immune systems are going to are going to keep them healthier. And you know what? Corona COVID-19 illness is real and it can be fatal. Mm -hmm. It can be serious. So I'm not trying to tell people to be reckless, but it's not a big deal for kids. They can go to school with no masks, no shields, just go to school. I mean, if, if it, it appears that natural infection will give you long lasting immunity, that will be much more robust than the immunity you get from vaccines. Well, that's right. So, there are three studies uh, that I, I know of, and I'm sure more will come out, but there, there are three studies recently that show that if you've had the, the coronavirus, the COVID-19, that you have lifelong immunity. They, they even did a study where they entered the bone marrow um, it takes samples of bone marrow and found that that the that months and months and months later the uh, antibodies that were there, yeah. um, because we've yeah. been told on the media, media has told us that you only have three months of um, uh, yeah, protection if you've had if you've naturally had wild COVID nineteen that in three months you could get it again and then another three months no. you could get it again. And, but this is what people have been told. Right. And yeah, that's not that's true. The, and the, the other truth is that those who have had natural infection are actually at greater risk of vaccine side effects. Really? So, uh, why I had a is guest that? On, Do you know why? Um, I had a guest on my show who, who went through that 
fairly well uh, a while back. Um, he, he's a strong proponent for test before you vaccinate. I mean, we have enough testing capability now, so anybody who's gonna get a vaccine should be tested to make sure they don't already have antibodies that they're not, because we're just simply seeing more reactions. And I think what it is, it's, they call it pathogenic priming. And somehow having been uh, exposed to that virus before, you already have some immune capability to respond, mm -hmm. actually very robust, capability to respond. And then if you get the vaccine, which is such a massive dose of spike protein, and you're already primed to respond to it, you can have this massive inflammatory response. And uh, mm. it's an unnatural trigger, right? If you get a natural infection, you just get a few little antigens come in through your nose, your immune system, boom, knocks it out before it becomes a big deal. If you get a vaccine with a massive exposure to spike protein, and you've got the capability to respond to that, well, you're going to get a massive response. So I, I think it's related to that. Um, I did want to cover one thing that I think, uh, well, two things. I want to talk about PCR testing and I also want to talk about absolute risk reduction and relative risk reduction. So okay. let's cover those two things because they are critical to understanding what's going on. I want to cover those. Before we cover those, just to wrap up the last topic, um, you talked about spike protein and uh, people can have reactions to it uh, regardless of if it's uh, through a vaccine or through natural immunity or you know, na naturally having COVID-19. If someone's not, if someone's had, uh, if someone's had COVID and they've had the spike protein in them, how how long until it's out of them? Or, or you know, you you mentioned that you have some resources for, for supporting the body around that. Um, what wh is this something that we should be watching for? Ish problems with spike protein, like six months after an infection, or is this only days or weeks after the infection? Um, I'm not going to claim to be an expert. Uh, to answer that question with mm -hmm. every every authoritative piece of science. I've done my best to keep up, but boy, it's coming fast. I have read that uh, for two weeks uh, after a vaccine, you can find spike protein in the blood. Mm -hmm. I've, re I've read that for longer than that, you can find uh, after a natural infection, you can find um, SARS-CoV-2 in the stool. So, you know, some people, I think it's around 10% of people get diarrhea and that virus is present in the stool longer. Uh, so that's speaking to natural infection. The other study was speaking to presence of this in the blood in a, in a vaccinated person. Uh, there are these reports, um, I think we'll hear more in the very near future, of vaccinated people somehow being able to transmit the spike protein to un unvaccinated people. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I get a lot of questions about that and I, I don't know quite what to tell people because it's just starting to come out, right? So it's something that's just starting to be discovered and researched, but it appears that that can happen. And so I'm not exactly sure of the mechanism, uh, but it, it's, it's one of those things where if you've been vaccinated, maybe for a couple weeks, you don't go around your unvaccinated loved ones. Just a thought. I mean, I don't have enough hard science to, to say that's a firm recommendation. It's just a thought. Mm -hmm. I've, I've heard that there's a lot of anecdotal stories out there. Um, so it'll be interesting to see the, to see the, the studies as it, as the science comes out. Um, I, I, I hate that term. The science is settled. It, it that, oh, uh, it's really, never settled. you know what Do dogma, re, you know, a religion is settled. <laughs> you know, this <laughs> even, is even that, right. Can, but the, the idea that uh, that science is something that's constantly moving, the target's constantly changing. Yeah. We're constantly learning new things. We're constantly, yeah. um, you know, disproving hypotheses and and disproving right. old studies. Uh, there's the science is settled is a is a term is a marketing term is a brainwashing yep. term. It's a brainwashing term. So the I just was reading a report from. Um, Dr. Kelly Sutton is an MD who wrote some exemptions in California, and she's in the trial right now. It started mm. yesterday. And the report was uh, the the other side, the people that are trying to take away her license, their attorney was able to silence uh, several complaints by saying, well, that science has been settled. And, and so it's that same thing. We're not going to go there. It's been settled. And what's so ridiculous about that is just think about it, folks. Kids born today 
are so different than their grandparents in terms of the world they're growing up in. Mm -hmm. Their grandparents got zero or one or two vaccines. They've had 72 vaccines by the time they graduate from high school. You know, they've had 40 by the time they're in school. They live in a world that's got all this glyphosate and pesticides and herbicides. And uh, it's a, just a different toxic world. And you cannot compare the science that was done on generations ago to what's going to happen to a kid today. Yeah. And just like with vaccines, most research is done where on people who've already had so many of them, right? And so then they're adding one more and going, see, it hasn't made anything worse. <laughs> but you don't know because you're not comparing them to an unvaccinated person. Yeah. Okay. Um, the spike protein, it causes inflammation in the body. Is that also what's causing the increase, uh, increase of bl blood clots, especially in healthy people that never had a, an issue of blood clotting before? Yeah, it seems to be definitely the, the trigger of that. I don't, I'm, again, I'm not the scientist that should describe the exact biochemistry or okay. biology of how that happens, but yes, they are definitely related. Well, and I definitely urge listeners to go back and watch your previous episodes uh, of your show where this has been discussed. Uh, uh, what was the name of the doctor again that talked about it on your show? Oh, Dr. McCullough. Dr. McCullough. Okay, so we yeah. can go check out that episode uh, for more information as well and follow Dr. McCullough's work as well to to get more information if listeners are interested. Uh, okay, you wanted to talk about PCR tests, right? Yes, please. So when this epidemic started rolling out, none of us knew what was going on. And the main form of testing, especially in the United States, but a lot of, a lot of places around the world was using PCR, preliminary chain reaction testing. This testing has this methodology where they call it amplification. So you, you, you throw your sample through a number of cycles of testing. Each time you're, you're analyzing a, a more dilute sample um, to, try to, to try to detect the most minute amount of material. And I've read two published studies out of Europe that are both showing the same finding that's just absolutely conclusive and important to understand. So at somewhere around 13 to 17 or 18 cycles of amplification, if you get a positive test, they can actually grow the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So in other words, that PCR represents a real virus being there. By the time you get, so that's, think about on a graph and up to 13, 14, 15, 16 cycles, you're getting a positive culture 100% of the time. Now, as you get into 30 cycles, you're down to like, I don't know, 20% of the time you can actually grow a virus. By the time you get to 34, 35 cycles of PCR amplification, you never grow a virus. It is just noise. And this is why you've, you've been able to get positive tests on healthy people who have they're absolutely nothing going on. They don't have the virus. It's just genetic noise. They never oh are able gosh. to grow the virus. So guess what the cycles that are being used in the United States until very recently? How many, how many cycles of amplification are they using? How many? 35 to 40, sometimes more than 40. And at 35 to 40, you have a 97% chance that it's a false positive. In other words, that positive test, it's, it's not COVID. Wait, 97% of the time, it, in, it was a, a false positive? A false positive. Are these you, the you, cases you, that they reported to us every day in the news for the last year it. and a half to fear us? You got us? it. You got it. So, it, so it's a case epidemic, not a COVID epidemic. And, and then the death numbers are equally amplified because anybody that dies, if they're in any way connected to a health system, which is where most people die, somehow really, you know, you get heart sick. Heart attack. Or, yeah. Well, it doesn't stroke, matter what. Motor whatever, vehicle accident. Motor, oh, really? Anybody who, oh, nursing homes. If you die of old age, and you test and it's positive. And remember, 97% of the positives in, in many instances is false. It isn't COVID. It gets labeled as a death with COVID. It wasn't from COVID, but it's with COVID and it gets counted. And so there's ample reports of this going on. The other phenomenon that's jacked up the numbers is that you can get tested multiple times, same person. 
So if I'm positive and I go back for another test and I go back for another test because I'm trying to get back to work or whatever reason I need a negative, each time I'm positive, that's a case. The system mm. doesn't, in most states, the system doesn't differentiate, oh, that's the same person. They're just reporting positive tests. So we have the scare tactic, fear tactics on all the channels of the news, the mainstream media of look at all these deaths, look at all these cases, uh, and then we've got a vaccine for you that'll solve the problem. So let me move over to absolute risk reduction and relative risk reduction. Folks, if you get this, you will no longer live in fear. You can set yourself free, walk, out, walk outside without a mask, which by the way, there are states. Uh, I have a, one of my nurse practitioners just came to help out from Florida. I'm sorry, from Ohio. And nobody's wearing a mask, indoors or outdoors. Florida is the same way. There's several states where masks are a thing of the past. Uh, I'm in Oregon. And I was just at the Oregon Zoo with my grandson, and it felt like 95% of people outside were walking around with masks. <laughs> so why is it so different? Is the virus just so much more dangerous in Oregon? No. <laughs> Oregon has one of the lowest rates in the country. We have fear. Our, our government, our governor, and our health department have done a masterful job of making sure that everybody is scared out of their wits. And so it's a fear campaign, but here's the trickery. It is absolute, it's unconscionable that, that reporters can, can report what they do and not be aware of this fact. So the studies that Pfizer and Moderna did that showed that their vaccine was 96% effective, 90% effective, you hear that on the news, right? Get this vaccine, it's 90% effective or it's 96% effective. What they're talking about is a relative risk reduction. So I'm just going to average out numbers. I don't, I'm not giving you the exact numbers because I don't have them in front of me right now. But take, for example, with Pfizer. And that initial study had 40,000 participants. Mm -hmm. So 20,000 people were given the vaccine. 20,000 were given saline, a placebo. Were they, given, case, I, were they given a uh, inert placebo or were they given something with other antigens in it? I think... I think in that one it was an inert placebo, but I know in some of the trials they were actually given a different vaccine, which is just weird to me. Like they picked a really yucky vaccine for side effects and we're going to give that instead. That'll be the placebo. You get this vaccine. It's like, oh my God. My point is this. When they, they were about three months into it, I believe, when they stopped the study as far as for their numbers. And there was about 200 cases of positive COVIDs. Okay. So out of 40 thousand people there were only 200 positives and that's when they stopped the analysis and they found that wow 96 percent of the positives were in the unvaccinated group so of those 20,000 people who were unvaccinated what was your risk of having a positive it was about one percent mm -hmm. so you have a you, it, now the real risk reduction, so the absolute risk reduction, not the relative one. So the 96% was relative to the vaccinated, but the absolute risk was 1%. And what was that risk for? It was risk for mild COVID symptoms, runny nose, cough, maybe fever. No, they didn't look at hospitalizations. They didn't look at deaths. So folks, would you like to take a vaccine that has about a 50-50 chance you're going to have side effects and maybe a 1 in 10 chance you're going to have serious, serious side effects and maybe a 1 in 10,000, I don't remember what the exact number is of death, when your chance of it helping you avoid mild symptoms is 1%. Oh my gosh. It makes absolutely no sense at all. But it's never presented that way. It's, it's like, so there was an actual mainstream journal. I'm trying to remember. It was, it was one of the biggies. It was like, was it the Lancet or the New England Journal or JAMA? One of those big threes. They had an article titled The Elephant in the Room. And they talked about this very fact. And they went through the major, I think three or four of the major uh, coronavirus camp, uh, companies, you know, Moderna and Pfizer and a couple of the other ones. And they pointed out the percentage of real risk reduction, actual AR, actual risk reduction, ARD, was around 1% or less. And they're going, what's going on, right? It's the elephant in the room. Nobody's speaking the actual truth of what's actually going on. So that's why I get a little frustrated when the narrative is so off. It is just fear-mongering, and especially when it comes to kids, folks. 
they are just not at risk from this disease, and the risk of the vaccine is just pretty horrendous. I mean, now we're getting all this uh, heart inflammation reports that are real. Oh, a good friend of mine is writing a, a, an article about that and just asked me, Actually, it's my co-author for my book, The Vaccine-Friendly Plan, Jennifer Margulis. She's a really good uh, investigative reporter. She says, uh, can you tell me, Dr. Paul, uh, you've been doing pediatrics for a long time. How common is pericarditis and myocarditis? So this is the inflammation around the heart or of the heart. Mm -hmm. I, I have seen zero cases in my career. And how many patients have you seen in your career, would you guess? Oh, my God. Um, Hundred thousand? I don't know. I mean, we have ten thousand patients. I don't see them all because I have a team. But um, I mean, if you take everybody over thirty years, ten thousand patients times thirty years—that's a lot of patients. Who some of them are the same patients, right, year to year? But um, it's a lot. I mean, it's a it's a massive number of patients, mm -hmm. and um, zero. Have you known? Had you know anyone or have heard a I colleague even, talk nope. about? I nope. treated this condition today. Yep. No, nope. my, my co-author's husband got pericarditis before COVID came around. And it's so rare that he had to be seen up at OHSU, the Oregon Health Science University for Oregon, you know, rare, complicated things, you end up there. And I mean, they had the, the top of the top people in the country consulting to figure out what the heck's going on here. You know, some rare, I'm guessing autoimmune, they, they just give it a label that's just a uh, descriptor, right? You you have inflammation around the heart, but nobody knows why. Uh, we are aware that autoimmunity is a growing cause of a lot of chronic problems. And um, vaccines are definitely on the list of possible triggers for autoimmunity. Mm -hmm. Well, and one thing that you brought up in episode 224, when I first had you on the show, you said, okay, like, when I was a kid, we didn't get vaccines as an infant, right? As a newborn, that, that, that they didn't roll that out to, uh, in Canada, they were giving the hep B. I remember I was in high school, so it was late 90s. And uh, I would be first in line. I was like, oh, their marketing was so good. I was, I rolled up my sleeve. I ran up. I was like, because I'm not afraid of needles. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm so happy that I'm like not into drugs and alcohol because I mean, I, I, I'm i not afraid of needles. I might have been a heroin addict if I if I was into <laughs> drugs. If I was into drugs, I might have gone there because I'm like, I, I'm not afraid of needles. And I wanted to prove yeah. how like macho Brave I am. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of a tomboy, you know, so I'm, I'm like, yeah, like, look at me because all these kids are afraid. And I'm like, I'm going to run up and I'm going to get this yeah. new hep how, how hepatitis. How it was in high school. Yeah, it was in the yeah. late nineties. And so yeah. I just remember they were like, Oh, this is really great. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, I mean, in Canada it's, you know, socialized medicine. So their marketing is, is more about let's, let's keep costs down um, sure, by keeping sure. everyone healthy and preventing illness. Um, but in the, in the States, was it 2005? Was that it that they started to say, we're going to give, uh, we're going to give a, a vaccine that we've only previously ever given like sex workers, uh, drug addicts and and nurses and those that, that basically get exposed to this. We've never given it out to the public as like a as a as a, a common vaccine. And all of a sudden now, 100 percent of the population starting right the moment they come out of their mother, we're going to give it to them. Uh, was it around 2005? Was that it? A little bit earlier. So, a little bit earlier? so. Your recollection is correct, though. We, my kids are around your ages, uh, around your age as well, the, my oldest ones. And they, uh, they got the vaccine. I, I was following the CDC schedule for my kids. Uh, they got the vaccine as teenagers, and that was in the 90s. Um, when, did they, so, when did they start giving it to newborns, though? So the newborn shift in Oregon, and it felt like it was a national push here in the U.S., was around 2002, 2003, right around then. Because the interesting thing was I specifically remember it because it was right when they got the mercury out of the vaccines. And I thought to myself, is this a coincidence or is this a planned event? Because I was so excited about getting the mercury out of the vaccine. I remember going to my youngest son's um, kindergarten teacher or first grade teacher, and I said, you're going to be, so, you see a lot of autism now and a lot of ADD and ADHD. He says, oh, yes. I says, well, don't worry. In five years, it's going to be gone. I mean, I was so convinced that that was the leading cause of, of that, you know, brain issue. Mm. And it never went away. In fact, it got slightly worse. But we replaced one bad thing, the mercury, with something that's 
probably equally bad, maybe worse, huge doses of aluminum. By shifting that hep B vaccine to newborn, two months, six months, that's three big doses of a really bad aluminum product. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the data is out there that that birth dose of aluminum is just horrendous. Um, that, or, or just the hepatitis B series itself. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not a good thing. So what my point that I was getting at is, uh, as a child, me growing up in the eighties, I was born in 1980 and, um, I never, I, I never attended school with, with a, with a child that was autistic. Um, I never saw it. I think I, I knew one person with asthma, Never, never did I know a child in any of the schools I attended that had childhood cancer or any autoimmune conditions. I met what actually I remember one kid was allergic to grass. And so she'd mm -hmm. get like a weird rash if she sat on the grass. But everyone growing up, super healthy, no yep. problems. Yep. And, um, and now we have a, so sometime in the late 90s, early 2000s, a hundred percent of all newborns are on a, di a different schedule than, than when I was growing up, when I, when I was growing yep. up, um, we, I had very few vaccines growing up and I went to com comparative to today. Right. And I, yeah. and I went to a, a, a pediatrician, uh, who was uh, actually quite famous in Toronto for being a fantastic doctor. Um, and he was well known, uh, to this day. And he, uh, I followed, you know, the schedule that, that Canada had laid out in the eighties and the nineties. And so nowadays the children who are, you know, 10 years old, 15 years old, that kind of thing, the levels of childhood cancer, the levels of autoimmune condition comparative to 30 years ago, let's say, like look at the before and after. And what you brought up in our last interview, you said, when we take a child and we we um, we overexcite the immune system with multiple doses of, of a vaccine, because the vaccine, it, it, its intention, its intention is fantastic. Its intention is to train the immune system to mount a healthy response. So if you ever come in contact with it, you can have a healthy response and have better outcomes. That's the intention. And I think right. that's a great intention. I want that for everyone. The, the problem is... What happens in actuality is the body um, it, it overexcites and and uh, makes the immune system become hyper hyperactive. Mm -hmm. and yep. hyper immune activation, it's called right. And and it it creates. I think think of it almost like carpet bombing. Instead of a targeted, the the attempt was we're just going to get antibodies against X, Y, or Z. But when it goes wrong, the immune system is now attacking um, yourself. Right, that's autoimmunity. So if you're attacking the islet cells of the pancreas, you've got type one diabetes. If you're attacking the uh, myelin sheath of your brain, you've got MS. If mm -hmm. you're attacking your, your cartilage in your joints, you've got arthritis, and and so on and so on. So yeah. these these children end up with a hyperactive immune system that then becomes autoimmune, which is what you just described. And then these children with autoimmune conditions who are still children are then put on immune suppressants and years later develop cancer because the immune system is not functioning correctly and can't clear out the, the unhealthy cancerous cells. And we're, we're creating wonderful uh, customers for the <laughs> pharmaceutical and medical industry. We're creating wonderful customers, customers for life until they die. Yeah. Um, you, ju you just outlined <laughs> what I like to point out is vaccines are probably the number three moneymaker for pharma, they trigger autoimmunity. When you're autoimmune, you have to give immunosuppressants, as you stated. That's the number one moneymaker for pharma. And when you suppress the immune system, you get cancers, the number two moneymaker for pharma. So number one, two, and three are all intertwined, turning you into an ATM cash machine for pharmaceutical companies. Trust me, folks, their interests are not in keeping you healthy. Their interests are financial. It's, it is such a dilemma to, to go upstream, you know, even me publishing this episode, I'm putting my career at risk. I'm putting my podcast at risk and you, you have put your career at risk and, and I'm, <laughs> I'm so grateful to your, to your bravery and courage for continuing to speak out for the health, well-being and safety 
of of all children and adults. Right. Um, well, th- is- thank you as well. You're absolutely right. You you are taking a risk, and you obviously are doing that because you care. Uh, that's the only reason I do this. It. Yeah. I mean that that financial uh, incentive paper that I wrote just shows, for example, that there is no financial reason for me to do what I'm doing. It. I mean, I walk in and I talk to patients. I can't right now because one of the conditions of my getting my license back was I can't talk about vaccines to patients. I'm, I figure I'm covered by free speech on a show. Uh, hopefully. But, yeah, hopefully. And folks, you know, everything we're discussing here is just informational. You please yes. run, run this by your trusted healthcare providers, hopefully somebody who's really uh, aware of what's going on Yeah. Uh, because too many doctors are not. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a real risk because of censorship that's going on at a very pervasive high level. Uh, if you speak out, uh, with, you know, facts and real data and science, or even if it was your opinion, I mean, we could say you and I have opinions. We should be allowed in this free country. If it truly is a free country, we should be allowed to share opinions and disagree and still be civil to one another. And, And I am trying to do that better these days. Um, I think because you and I might be a lot on the same page, it sounds like we don't like vaccines. But I'm with you at the beginning of the show when you stated, you know, everybody's got to make their own decisions and we need to love one another and Mm -hmm. and 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 support one another's opinions, because this way of keeping people divided is is really uh, not a good strategy for us to have long term good health. Um, It just gives more power to the big big businesses that are trying to take more control. They can keep us fighting over, you, you name the issue, whether it's political, whether what you're this party or that party, or whether it's over a, a hot topic of the day. Um, if we can keep people divided, whether, whether it's on race or some other issue, parties, it doesn't matter, religion, anything that keeps people divided keeps them distracted from what's really going on, which is that you are slowly giving up your freedoms. You're slowly giving up your rights. And right now they are attacking your body. We're turning humans into GMO humans. It's never been done before. It never should have been done. And it's being done on a massive worldwide stage with a experimental vaccine. This vaccine is not FDA approved, by the way, folks. It is still experimental. And that's the one thing I think maybe could put this to an end is these companies that are requiring vaccines. So if I have to go get a vaccine because this company made me do it and I'm injured, I can sue that company. They aren't protected. The vaccine manufacturers are protected Mm -hmm. because of the way the laws have been written. So they're just going like crazy. Just everybody should get it, you know, cha-ching, cha-ching. But companies that insist that you get it in these schools, these universities that are insisting, they are liable. And so there's going to be some lawsuits. And when that finally starts hitting in a big way, I think businesses will have to think twice about whether or not they want to become liable for the damage these vaccines are causing, because these damages are just going to start accumulating to the point where it's not going to be possible to keep them hidden. We talked about, you just mentioned, I uh, hope we're protected on our uh, amendment rights to be able to have freedom of speech. Um, the next episode in publishing, actually, uh, after this one, is an interview I did recently with a doctor who has practiced for many years, and he's an MD who who studied holistic medicine, and he chose to treat all of his COVID patients with the same um, uh, formula, the same protocol that he has treated all upper respiratory illnesses for the last 20, 30 years um, using natural medicine. And... Uh-huh. He had such a huge success rate. He published it on his blog that he's been running a blog since the 90s. And it was something like, um, you know, certain vitamins, certain things you inhale, all all natural substances. And he also wouldn't do an injection in the buttocks of ozone. And But he had most of the stuff you could do at home and take at home, that kind of thing. And, um, And at that time, he had treated a hundred, just about a hundred patients and all of them survived. Yeah. And, uh, this was early on last year and the FCC wrote him a letter, FCC, not FDA, the FCC wrote him a letter saying you're in violation. You have to take this down. You have to take your blog down. And he said, what are you talking about? And they said, you cannot make claims that you're treating COVID-19. You can't do that. 
uh, because there's no studies, published studies. And he said, well, this I'm, I'm practicing medicine. I'm a doctor. Aren't I allowed to practice medicine the way I see fit? And they said, no. You are not allowed to do that. Now he had he for years. He he if he said I treat, I I treat arthritis with these vitamins and minerals. They they wouldn't. I you know I cure arthritis with this this this. If he if he said that, they didn't have a problem. They and which he did on his blog for many years. They had a problem the fact that he was treating and publishing that he was treating COVID nineteen. And yeah. so he said, okay, if I'm going to, okay, I'll, I'll do what you say. I'm going to go publish a, a study. So at then he got all of his information together and he has now, he's now had 400 patients at this point with, uh, with COVID and um, all of them lived and very few hospitalized. It was, I, I don't remember the exact numbers. It was like five or something. I don't know. It was a very small amount, but he had great, great, great success. And they all, they all recovered really well. And so then he found a, a journal and he published it and he, he came back to the FCC and said, here, a published study on my, on proving that I can, I can claim that this is a treatment. And they said, no, it needs to be placebo double blind study. So they keep changing the target. But he said, that's unethical. That's unethical to, when I know what works for my patients to then right. do a to do a placebo and let them die or let right. them be harmed. Right. That is unethical. Yep. So, so th I hope we have, I hope we still have our first men in rights, but we, he, his, he's married to a lawyer. So he ended up, he tried to fight it. He then took his blog down and then he wrote a book and he found out that b his blog on the internet is not protected for some reason. Um, when he's laying out the, the, the treatment plan. Yeah. For COVID-19. And then he said, but apparently a book is 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 still considered a uh, protected free speech. And so he wrote a book and published it with all of his all of his findings, basically. Yeah. Um, uh, that that definitely scares me. <laughs> well, even books. So I wrote a book early on in this COVID outbreak because I had a dear friend almost die, was hospitalized mm -hmm. before I even knew he was sick. And he was, they wanted to intubate him so bad. And he just said, no way. He had already been hearing the reports that once you're intubated, it was an 80% chance of dying. Mm -hmm. So he went with almost, you know, very low oxygen for three nights, couldn't sleep. He knew if he fell asleep, he'd be dead. Um, and I was able to help him a little bit from just texting him when he, once he was, could get access to his phone. Uh, but yeah, my book was accepted on Amazon and then last minute taken down because I did not adhere to the World Health Organization criteria. I didn't meet World Health Organization standards on management of COVID. And so- What you know, is you can... the World Health Organization <laughs> standards on the management of COVID? Is it to wear uh, a mask and wait till the vaccine comes out? Yeah, you got it. At that point, it was uh, do nothing and wait till you, you're bad enough to be intubated, right? I mean, it was just, it was insanity because we already knew uh, it's pretty clear that adequate having really robust vitamin D levels is probably the most important thing you can do. Everybody should be doing that now and forevermore. Just because that's the one vitamin we're almost universally deficient because you have to be in sunlight to convert enough, to make enough active vitamin D. And we wear clothes when we're outside. And if we're in the northern hemisphere, far away from the equator, it's the sun doesn't do its job very well anyway. Well, and you also have to have healthy liver, healthy kidneys, and enough uh, healthy fats. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, censorship is alive and well, and it's getting worse and worse. Uh, it's 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 a real problem for there's, our democracy. There's a concerted effort to make the population do what they say. And yep. that is not for our best interests when not we at look all. at the data. And yep. that scares me. And I, you know, I, there's so many listeners who are like, I, I trust, I, I, you know, I trust these people, like right? I trust these organizations. These organizations have good people in them. Yes, every organization has good people in them. We don't know what's going on at the top, right? We don't. And 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 why is it that that these different organizations? Why is it that Amazon is is so um, eager to comply with the World Health Organization instead of the um, the Constitution? Yeah, you know, like just just like why are these independent companies so eager to follow this one direction when this one direction is showing it's doing harm, and right. and why is showing alternatives that are proven safe and effective um, becoming illegal? Yeah, 
No, when, our, our, there, there's huge financial incentive, right? And it's all about control and money. Yeah. Power, power, control, and money has always been the underlying any sort of uh, major shift, right? Yeah. Uh, especially if you're seeing this is modern day book burning. I mean, we we really have a problem on our hands. And listeners, if if you're still with us, <laughs> this show has been going on a while. Uh, take take your power back, right? You, the individual, have the power to live free, but only if you insist on it because it's they're coming for you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Paul Thomas. I value your work. And my listeners are used to long interviews because they love really, really learning the nitty gritty from our guests. And you've definitely laid out some very interesting points. We're going to make sure that all the links to everything that Dr. Paul Thomas said is in the show notes of today's podcast, alerttruehealth.com. Is there anything that you'd like to say to wrap up today's interview or anything that you really want to make sure that you that came across in today's interview? Yeah, just listeners, please just be kind to yourself. Do whatever you can to get uh, away from fear because fear is bad for your immune system. So number one thing for that is just turn off the TV. Get outdoors as much as you can. If you get out into nature you're walking in a forest or you're swimming in the ocean or, or uh, in the garden, in any way you can get out into nature, you will notice that the rest of the animal kingdom is absolutely fine. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> there, none of them are lining up for a vaccine. They are absolutely fine, even in a toxic world that we have. So remember that you are uniquely gifted by your birth with a very good immune system and a way to heal yourself, but you do need to get the right nutrients. You need to avoid toxins. And um, yeah, just be careful about what you might put into your body. Uh, consider it your temple and um, take vitamin D, if nothing else, and then uh, prepare yourself in the event that you do get sick with this COVID. It's pretty rare, but if, if it happens, don't just sit around waiting to get sicker. Uh, go to the frontline doctors, check out my show, doctorsandscience.com. Uh, the show is called Against the Wind, Doctors and Science Under Fire. But uh, I'm trying to bring to you what you need to know to remain healthy despite this crazy world we're living in. So I'm sending you love and uh, wishing you the very best. Thank you, Ashley, so much for having me on your show. Thank you so much.